Welcome to Authorization in Software, the podcast that explores everything you need to know about authorization. I'm your host, Damian Schenkelman, and in each episode, we'll dive deep into authorization with industry experts as they share their experiences and insights with you. If you're a software developer or just someone that's interested in the world of authorization in software in general, you are in the right place. Let's get started. My name is Damien Schenkelman, and today I'm chatting about authorization and macaroons with Neil Madden, founder at Illuminated Security and author of API Security in Action. Hey Neil, it's great to have you here. Hi Damien, it's great to be here. Could you give our listeners a brief overview of your background and what are you up to today? Yeah, of course. Um, so as you said, I'm Neil Madden, and uh, I'm currently uh, running a startup called Illuminated Security, We're providing kind of application security training on things like JSON web tokens, things like that, uh, and a bit of consultancy. Uh, before that, though, I was the security architect for Fordrock, where I worked for a bit over nine years off and on. Um, I'm also the author of the book API Security in Action, which was published by Manning a couple of years ago. Um, and in my spare time, I also a kind of bit of a security researcher to kind of look for vulnerabilities in, in software. So some of your listeners, uh, may know me from a major vulnerability I found in Java's synaptic curve signature software last year called, um, psychic signatures. Uh, I'm also quite a long time regular contributor to the OAuth working group at the IETF. So. I've kind of helped shape some of the more recent standards that have come out of that group, um, and uh, pretty pretty active there. That's neat. Uh, it seems you've been thinking about cryptography and how to use it to secure APIs for quite a while, which is a big reason uh, I, I'm really excited about having you here. Uh, I've been thinking about doing a, a Macaroons episode since I started the podcast, and when I started thinking about it, I was like, who, who can I invite and and your name came up in conversations with other folks. I read your post. So I was like, yeah, Neil is the person to, to have on here. Um, could you maybe share with folks what a macaroon is and, and why we're talking about it in the context of authorization? Yeah, of course. So uh, macaroons were invented by Google. They um, uh, produced a research paper, I think almost 10 years ago now, uh, where they described this new approach to um, authorization token. Um, so they're really, in some ways, they're similar to a JSON web token, a JOT, but they're, they're much more constrained. They only have one algorithm for, um, and it's a very simple algorithm, uh, but they have some interesting new properties that JOTs don't have. So um, in particular, you can add these things called caveats to, to a token after it's been issued. So with, with a JOT, you, you, you issue it, issues a token, and then it's kind of fixed for the life of that token. Uh, whereas with a macaroon, after it's been issued, anyone can add these things called caveats to it, which restrict how that token can be used. Um, so there's kind of this nice, nice thing you can do where you can you can change the token after it's been issued. Nice. So we, we introduced a few concepts there. We talked about JSON web tokens, and we also talked about algorithms. Uh, can can we maybe share like? What a JSON web token? People might not be familiar with it. And, and also, what's an algorithm when we think about the JSON web token? What's the algorithm? What's, what is it used for? Right. So, um, hopefully, people are familiar with like cookies and things like that. So, when you go and log into a website, you get a, a cookie set in your, in your web browser, uh, which kind of remembers who you are. And, and the traditional way those were, those were done was you know, you logged in and then details about the user was stored in some kind of backend database and some kind of random ID was generated um, that was then became the cookie. And then every time you sent the cookie back, you'd go and look it up in the database and find the information. Um, and, um, and so JSON web tokens and things like that are a way to do that without having the database, basically. So you can encode all of the information into into JSON or some other format like that, um, and and then you sign it cryptographically with with a secret key uh, to protect it against tampering, uh, forgeries and things like that. And then and then that encoded token uh, becomes your cookie or your access token or, or whatever else you're using for authorization. Uh, and then you don't need the database. And, and so when uh, that token is presented, you can verify the signature, check it hasn't been tampered with, and, and then um, 
uh, extract the details from the token. So um, JSON web tokens support lots of different algorithms. So um, the simplest one they support is something called a HMAC, which stands for hash-based message authentication code. Uses. We're talking about algorithms for for signing the token. You mean, right? Right, right. So, um, so you 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 can sign it either with this thing called HMAC, which, as I said, is a is a message authentication code where you have a secret key, and both the person signing issuing the token and the person verifying it have to have access to that shared secret key. Uh, but then. JSON Web Tokens also support public key algorithms where there's a private key that signs the token and then there's a public key uh, which can only verify the tokens and then you can distribute the public key to all your API servers or whatever and they can verify the tokens without being able to fit. Um, so macaroons just use HVAC basically. So it's always based on a shared secret. Um, so this is a uh, pro to con for macaroons, um, but that's the one algorithm they support. Um, and so the the issue and the verifier of tokens and macaroons have to have the shared secret key. On the plus side, you get these nice properties of being able to append these caveats, and HMAC is really fast. It's a lot faster than um, most like public key signature algorithms and things. Okay, so, so to recap, and, and let me know if, if I got this right, back back in the day, we, we started storing some of big, large string in a cookie and that was a reference to something in the database that, that represented data about your, your authentication and your session. At some point we said, hey, can we make this stateless? Stateless is easier to scale because you don't require state in the database. We, we can just horizontally scale adding more servers. Yes, we can. We can use cryptography instead. So we started storing JSON sign and, and again, that could be signed with a a typical kind of like secret shared key, or it could be signed using a public private key cryptography. At some point, we, and then you said, okay, that's a JSON web token. The thing about the JSON web token is that once it's been signed by what we, we refer to typically as a signer or, or the issuer, it doesn't change. And, and this is where kind of like macaroons come in. You can add these things called caveats that allow you to kind of change the macaroon. And in exchange for that, again, you, you need to rely on using shared secrets, you can't go uh, with the, the public key format. What are the, like, what's a caveat and, and like, how can I use it? What are the use cases for it? Right. So there's, there's a couple of different types of caveats. Um, the simplest ones are what's called first party caveats. Uh, and then there's another thing called third party caveats, which we'll maybe talk about later on. So first party caveats are they're like they're just a restriction on how the token is used, um, and they are just in macaroons. They're just a string which describes some kind of condition that has to be true when the token is used. Um, in terms of uh, things like cookies or access tokens and things like that that people will be familiar with, um, you could think of it like a caveat as being like the so, for example, like the expiry time on the token, you know, when it's get issued, it, it will have some expiry time, which may be like two hours in the future or 24 hours or, or whatever. Um, and you could add a, add a caveat that says, um, actually, now the expiry time is only five seconds in the future. So why is that useful? You might think, like, if I've got this token. Why do I want to limit myself to it only expiring a lot sooner than it was to other? But, well, the reason for this is... Um, when you're going to send that token somewhere where you don't fully trust where it's going, like you don't trust the network or you don't trust the recipient on the other side. So if you're about to make a network request to go to access some API, then you've got a cookie or something that's valid for 24 hours. If that cookie gets stolen on that request, then the attacker can use it for 24 hours until it expires, right? which is quite a long period of time. But what you can do with macaroons is you can you can create a copy of that token, that cookie, and you can add this caveat saying actually it only expires in five seconds and then send that version over the network. And then if somebody steals it, it's only good for five seconds. Um, and you can add different types of caveats. In the original paper, they call these contextual caveats. And you, you're res restricting the token based on the context of the request you're just about to do. Like 
if you were doing some kind of transaction and you had some kind of unique ID in that request, then you could maybe add that as a caveat. And then it's only it's only valid for that one request. But you've still got the original macaroon without those caveats attached to it. So you can still use it for 24 hours or whatever. And every time you make a request, you create a copy of it and you add some more restrictions related to the request you were just about to make. Um, and then that means that if, if those copies get stolen, um, either on the network or because of some insecure coding on the server or, you know, leaking in server logs or all the other ways that these things can happen, then what's been stolen is a much more restricted token than the one you originally issued. It seems using macaroons and, and some of the use cases becomes interesting and, and you take advantage of them when, when we have different parties in the system and, and the one holding kind of like, I would say, an original macaroon doesn't have, a, I'm going to use quotes, although people cannot see them, a high level of trust of, of other parties in the system. Um, but we, we use you and like, a, hey, who can issue it and, and who can kind of like add caveats to a macaroon. Maybe we can kind of like go a, a, a step before and think about an example. So what's a, the story of a macaroon? How does a macaroon get issued and, and what's a typical party that would issue it and, and who would it issue it to? Right. So um, there's lots of different ways and scenarios. So they could be used kind of in the same way that JSON web tokens are used, you know, for all kinds of different um, situations. Um, so to, to issue the macaroon, you just need to have this secret key uh, that you use to create it. And then they have this identifier, um, which is just a, an arbitrary kind of string that you can put stuff in. Um, so that could be something like you could still have a, a traditional database token and have a, an ID that's like opaque and refers to that. Or you could put in some structured JSON or something, something like a job claim set. Uh, and then you kind of sign it with your secret key using HMAC and then you then you issue it. Um, and so, you know, if you think about the examples, so you, you can use them as a kind of better cookie, which was how Google originally pitched them. So you you go inside into your website, your, your website produces a macaroon as the cookie and send it to the server, um, which we're then going to send it back. Uh, you'd have to have some JavaScript on 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 the web client, which is then, you know, looking and appending these caveats uh, to them, you know, it'd be nice to think maybe in the future, you know, Google could uh, change Chrome to sort of uh, automatically add caveats when you, when cookies got sent in, but uh, I don't see them doing that anytime soon. Um, uh, and then uh, there's also, so uh, one of the things we were looking at at Fordrock was using it within the OAuth system. So having access tokens issued by an authorization server as macaroons, uh, which would then be verified by um, resource set with some APIs. And it was a, there was a couple of ways we were kind of looking at doing that. So as I said before, because these are based on shared secret keys, you can either trust all your APIs and give them access to that secret key to verify stuff, but then um, they they also then have the capability to mint their own access tokens, which is uh, more trust than you you typically want to to give them, right? Um, uh, and you know, particularly then, if if any of those servers gets compromised and that key gets compromised, then you you've lost you know the keys to your whole um, authorization kingdom, really. Um, so a different way you can do it is to issue these macaroons as tokens, but then still have your API servers call back into the authorization server to validate using something like token introspection, which is the standard um, OAuth uh, API for validating an access token. So that, that was typically used with database-backed kind of stateful tokens, but you can use it with macaroons as well. I mean, it's kind of... Obviously, then you've got the latency of these kind of network overheads when you want to validate tokens, but you get things like, you know, means of revoking tokens and you can still horizontally scale your authorization server on high behind scenes. That's, that's neat. There, there's a bunch of concepts here and, and I, I'm going to try to unpack them and maybe when dig deep in with a few questions. So it seems there are a few scenarios 
where you might start kind of like issuing a macaroon. You talked about two, you said you are an app or a, or a server. Someone starts a session with you, you issue a macaroon to the client, and then the client sends it back to you with a can when, when they're using it as part of the cookie, as part of either an API call to the same server. And because you issued it, you, you naturally can um, sign these, which means you have the secret to, to verify them. Now, that, that's one scenario. In that case, so let, let's talk about that one in particular. Who is the party that gets the macaroon? Who, and who would add caveats? Like, where do you see, okay, like I, I'm getting a macaroon from, let's say, a website that kind of like hacks authentication back in, they, they are not delegating with OAuth or anything. Um, who would get that macaroon and, and sh uh, like essentially add a caveat to it, right? Attenuate it to share it with another party. And what would that party or what could that party be? Yeah. So, so there's a bunch of different um, things here. So um, uh, one example is just the client is something like a, a web app um, and there's JavaScript running in your browser or it could be something like a mobile app, things like that. And, it, and it's taking this token and then it's just doing what we said before. So it's adding these contextual caveats before it makes API calls. Um, um, so that as a secure, pure security mechanism, just, you know, if that token gets um, intercepted somehow or or leaked somehow in that request, the, the what gets stolen is less... Um, um, it's less of an impact than, than if the original token was, was stolen. So um, in that case, it, it essentially, it's, attenu it's attenuating or adding caveat, and then it sells for itself. So it, it has kind of like the updated macaroon with some restriction, and then that's what sent over the wire. And, and what you're trying to limit there is if someone can steal that over the wire, what they steal is no, no longer maybe going to be valuable in five seconds or next time. It is that kind of like one use case. Yeah, that, that, that's one use case. So, so it's kind of, uh, it keeps the unrestricted version to itself and then it can um, send this this more restricted version over the network. Um, or, you know, to, because you might as well, like a client might get an access token, which is valid to access a whole bunch of different APIs, right? Which are sitting on different servers and maybe run by different people and, and so on. Uh, and so if, if one of those servers is compromised or something, then when it gets your access token, it can use that access token to access all the other servers as well. Um, whereas uh, one of the things you can do with caveats is you can add an audience restriction to a token after the fact. So, so the original token might be valid for these five different servers, but before I call this one, I will add an audience restriction that makes it just valid for that. So for instance, um, if you look at like Google Cloud, for an example, they have, you know, you get an access token from them and you can you can access like hundreds of different APIs cloud with this uh, token. Um, and so you might have a token that's, that can access all kinds of backend services there. Um, and that's useful for your app because it needs to access these at different times. Um, but when you make the actual calls, you can append this caveat saying, right now on this call, that's only valid for this one API. And then if somebody steals it, they can only access that one API with it. They can't access all the others. In that case, you're you're making the client an, an issuer, let's say the server, but the, let's say the issuer of the macaroon and the client, it's a less chatty relationship, right? They just get the macaroon once and, and the client attenuates it when calling the API and the server rather than having to go get I would say a more restrictive version each time they want to call one particular API. So that you're kind of you're gaining security by make it, putting the onus on the client to restrict things, while at the same time reducing load on, on your servers in terms of like not having to issue this kind of like attenuated specific versions of the tokens. Yeah, exactly, exactly. There's also um, some things you can do when we some more advanced cases when you start looking at these third-party caveats, which we haven't talked about yet. Before before we get into third-party caveats, which I know are uh, are a thing in, in and of themselves, uh, I wanted to chat more about kind of like the, the OAuth case, right? You, you mentioned, okay, we, we explored issuing an access token that has 
that is a macaroon, and, and we, you talked about well, but you get into the problem with symmetric keys. Maybe we can talk about kind of like typical parties in in the macaroon system and, and t- typical parties in the auth system. Like how how are how could these be the same, and and what does it mean? You you also hinted at some of these things. Like hey, if I if I use macaroons, I need to share the secret between the authorization server and the resource server. Uh, how does that compare, for example, with the JSON web tokens? And, and is that even possible? Like, w- what are the trade-offs here? Right. Um, so, yeah, as you said, with this shared secret um, thing, the, this, I mean, when people use JSON web tokens, uh, auth, what they normally want to do is they have the authorization server has the private key, it signs the token, uh, and then they distribute the public key to all of their API servers, their resource servers, and they can then validate those tokens without having to coordinate or talk to the authorization server at all. Um, with macaroons, at least with, with the version of macaroons that's been kind of used and deployed everywhere, that you can't really do that pattern because you have to share this this secret key. So you'd be putting way too much trust in your resource servers then, really. Um, and so. The typical way you would use them is you'd use token introspection, which is an OAuth standard, which is why this is part of the reason why I think macaroons and OAuth work quite nicely together, which is that um, macaroons lack, there's no standard for macaroons and there's no standard for kind of these interactions and things, whereas OAuth provides this nice framework um, for how all these interactions happen. Um, but it doesn't specify what the tokens look like. So you can kind of plug in and get the best of both of these. Um, so what you can do is you can have your secret key is just in your authorization server and the clients talk to it to get a, an access token and that will be a math room. And then when your resource servers want to validate that access token, they call the token introspection endpoint, which is a standard OAuth um, API to validate an access. So they call into it and say, hey, here's this access token. I want to validate it. And one of the nice things um, we were able to do at Fordrop when we implemented this is that um, the response to that token introspection um, API is a JSON document that sort of says, you know, is this access token valid? When does it expire? What's the audience that it's intended for? What's the scopes and things like that? Um, and with macaroons, what we allowed is people to add caveats that can restrict any of those things. So they can restrict the expiry time, restrict the scope, and all those kind of things. And the authorization server would look at this macaroon that came in, it would validate the scope, uh, the signature, then it would look at all of these caveats and it would automatically incorporate them into the introspection response. So, as far as the resource server is concerned, it just looks like an ordinary introspection response for any other kind of access token. But if you've appended a caveat that says this expires in five seconds, then the expiry time on the response will reflect that. If you've appended, if the original access token had five scopes that it was validated valid for, and you appended a caveat that reduced that to two, then the token introspection response will just show those two scopes as being the scopes of the access token. That, that makes sense. I can imagine there are some trade-offs there, particularly if we think about how we started the conversation, right? We said we went from opaque cookies with opaque strings that were references to a database to we want to use crypto so that we can scale this. And, and if we go with an approach like this, the resource server has to call the authorization server to do introspection, which means that, that there's added latency in that call. And, and depending on where your resource servers, your APIs are deployed, they might be around the globe. They have to call maybe a centralized location if you have a centralized authorization server. Uh, it also means that you your authorization server becomes kind of like a point of failure for, for your API. Uh, how do you think about this trade-offs in, in the design and maybe what other trade-offs are there when, when using such a design? Right. Uh, that's exactly, those are all really good points that, um, that people need to consider. So all of those things are true. So there is some extra latency in Organization server, there is then becomes a single point of failure and things like that. Uh, where I think it's different from um, the database uh, approach is that you can still horizontally scale 
your authorization server. So a database typically is really hard to horizontally scale anything that has state that you have to kind of synchronize and look up. Whereas here you, you can distribute that secret key to all your kind of um, cluster of authorization servers and you can scale those. So even though you're calling back into this authorization server, all it has to do is validate the signature, right? So it doesn't have to look at the database. So there is still uh, the opportunity for more horizontal scalability. Um, and in return for that, you get some some nice features. So it, it's easier generally to kind of um, do checking whether the token has been revoked and things like that. There's also something I think which is not talked about often in, in OAuth um, is the kind of um, traditional software engineering idea of encapsulation, which is, you know, the idea that you should hide the details of of things that you might want to change later. One, one of the things you might want to change later is what kind of access tokens you need, what kind of form. So if you say access tokens are JOTs and all of my API servers know that and they will validate them, then it's really hard later on to ever change to something other than JOTs, right? Whereas if you're calling back to the authorization server to intercept your tokens, then, then what format those tokens are is kind of encapsulated by the authorization server and is hidden from those things. And so you can start with like a database back token, change it to some like a macaroon, maybe later on you decide actually macaroons were wrong, I would change it to jots. And your API servers don't have to change because the authorization server is handling that. So, so there's these trade-offs and, and the trade-off for that is that you add this added, added uh, latency and potentially single point fade and those kind of things. Yeah, yeah. I, I really like how you, you not only kind of like added to the trade-offs, but also explain kind of like the no this notion of, of encapsulation. And at the end of the day, I think you have to make choices that are informed for what you think your application needs. For example, if you think about like, if you're doing a, a authorization for a B2E application, well, your employees are likely going to continue using whatever you're doing because like, first of all, they're stuck there. And also it's not latency sensitive. At the same time, if you think about like maybe e-commerce where it's well known that latency affects the conversion and how, how, how much people buy, then you might go with another approach and yeah, you trade off encapsulation, but you gain performance. That, that's, that's very interesting. Um, I want to kind of like now double down on, on some of the capabilities of macaroons because again, we, we've talked about the caveats on the first, first party. We've talked about how, how you can use them for, for verification and, and particularly in the auth flow. But you mentioned this thing about like third party caveats and, and we talked about it a couple of times and, and now I think it's kind of like time to open up that box. Um, what, what is a third party caveat and, and how does it kind of like come to the table? Right. So third party, party caveats are um, really kind of amazing and also a bit scary at the same time. So with first party caveats, we had it as like, you know, they're just a... Um, a condition they're just kind of some string that you have to check uh, time with a third party caveat the idea is that you're adding a condition to a token that requires the client to go to some third party service and get a proof that it satisfies some condition um so it, it's not something that the resource server or the verifier can check themselves locally it requires some other service to do it. so classic example that's kind of used a lot which um i think helps illustrate it but perhaps is not that real world is the idea of like proving that you're over 18 or over 21 like say you're going to use this um this macaroon to go and buy some alcohol from an online store and that that wants some kind of proof that you are old enough to to buy this based on the local you know laws or whatever um and so the idea is it can issue this token and it has this third party caveat that points at some sort of, you know, government age verification service. And so you as a client then have to go to this service and get this proof, which is known as a, a discharge macaroon that, that proves that you are, um, you know, over 18 or 21 or whatever, whatever it is. And then you present both your original macaroon and this discharge macaroon when you want to buy your alcohol and it can 
tie the two together. There's some, some clever kind of cryptography that's used, used for that. Um, so another, another use case where what I was kind of working on um, at Fordrop, which um, this was when there was a lot of talk around sort of um, uh, open banking and things and um, you know, PST2 and these kind of financial APIs that wanted to fine-grained authorization of transactions. Um, and so there was a demo I came up with, which was around uh, that kind of thing. So the idea is that you you would have, um, uh, you'd install like a banking app on your phone and then you do a normal OAuth 2 flow for that app to say, yeah, I want to be able to issue, you know, transactions from your banking app. Uh, and so you'd approve that as a normal OAuth 2 flow and you'd get a Macaroon access token. Um, but you don't want to just let that app just initiate whatever transactions it wants. You want to be able to actually approve everything it does right, individually. Um, and so you can attach a third-party caveat to that access token that requires it to go to a separate transaction authorization service every time it wants to perform a transaction. And that transaction authorization service would go and actually, you know, communicate with the user, say, you know, this app is trying to transfer $2,000 or whatever to, to this thing. Is that okay? Uh, and, you know, you need to prove it on your phone or or, or whatever. Uh, and then once that was all approved, this transaction authorization service would issue this discharge mac, which, which authorizes just that one specific uh, transaction. And then and then the app can then present these two tokens together to then go and actually to the bank to actually go and initiate this transaction. And so you get this kind of long-lived access token that authorizes the app to to even start initiating a transaction, to even ask for a transaction. And then you get these these short-lived discharge tokens that, that approve the individual ones. I get it. So... The client seems to have kind of like an, an incomplete puzzle that the, the server will then verify and it needs to figure out how to put this puzzle together. In, in you mentioned a couple of cases, the decoverant age verification service, the financial transaction approval. How does the client put the puzzle together? Right. So um, the way these third-party caveats work is that is the caveat... Um, when uh, whoever creates the caveat adds it to the um, to the original macaroon, they create a new secret key, and that secret key gets encrypted and and added into the caveat in a way that the verifier of that macaroon will be able to recover it, but nobody else can. Um, and then um, when the client sees this caveat on on the token, it knows it's going to have to go and fulfil this this. Um, uh, requirement, but it can't access that that secret key. So what it has to do, there's a location hint which tells it where to go to go and get this discharge macaroon. Um, and there's no actual standard in macaroons for how this happens. So there's a, there's a bit of some missing gaps here, and you have to kind of invent your own conventions for this at the moment. Um, but basically, the client will go to this URL and it will present this caveat to the URL. Um, and uh, that that service, that third party service of that and that URL will then check does this client satisfy this caveat, and it will be able to understand what the caveat is. That service will also be able to um, uh, well, there's a couple of ways this happened, but but often it will be able to decrypt something to get this secret key. So if it's satisfied, the client satisfies the uh, the condition that's in that caveat then it can recover that secret key and it uses that secret key to create a new macaroon, which is called the discharge macaroon. And then it issues that discharge macaroon to the client and that's its proof that these things happen. And then the client then presents its original macaroon in this discharge macaroon to the API, which then verifies it. And as part of its verification of the original macaroon, it will decrypt this secret key and then it can go, hey, oh, look, I've got I've got this discharge macaroon that corresponds to this, and I'll use the secret key to verify that discharge. Uh, 
where I mean that's kind of mind blowing itself. Where it gets even more mind blowing is that that discharge macaroon is itself a macaroon, and you can add more caveats to that macaroon. So, uh, including new third party caveats. So, in general, you might have this like tree of caveats that have to be verified and things. Yeah, you you might end up as you say with a tree with a, a very long chain of, of things to verify, and ultimately, it, it seems that the Again, there is no end to it, right? Like you could keep adding macaroons to, to it and, and so on. You also mentioned that there is no standard on, on how to agree on, on a location and, and essentially how to get a discharge macaroon for, for a third party macaroon to be able to kind of like f fulfill the, the caveat, show that, that you, you, you're proving that it's successful. What other things do you kind of like need to? informally agree on a system to, to make macaroons work. Right. So this this is, in my opinion, the kind of the biggest weakness with macaroons at the moment is that there's, you know, when you go and look at something like JSON Web Tokens, there's an RFC that defines JSON Web Tokens, and then there's like four other RFCs that it builds on that define all the cryptographic algorithms and things like that. There is nothing like that for macaroons. There is, there is the original research paper, and then there was a kind of like, de facto standard implementation was that was done called lib macaroons that it's been kind of ported to different languages but a lot of these details are just left blank so things like even for first party caveats they're just they're just strings and what those strings are is is not specified anywhere so it's not like uh with jot claims where you have like an exp, exp claim that says that's an expiry time and things like that there's nothing like that. So that all um, has to be um, agreed. So in Fordrop, when we did our implementation uh, for OAuth, we based those things on existing things around jobs and so on. So if you want to restrict the expiry time of a Fordrop access token macaroon, you add a caveat, which is a little JSON object with an XBXP thing with an expiry time in it. And likewise, you, you ord if you want to AUD if you want to restrict the audience scope if you want to restrict the scope things like that. So we kind of based it on that as a kind of as a standard, but that's kind of that makes us non-standard with other macaroon implementations, which which use other other ways of doing this. Um, yeah, and the, the same then with these third-party caveats. There's there's a format for how you kind of encode the caveat. Uh, and you can have this little encrypted key and some little identifier that gets given to the third party service. Um, and you can put a location hint in there, which kind of tells the client where it has to go. But, but what it does when it gets to that URL is, is completely unspecified. You know, does it do a post? You know, does it send something JSON? How does it communicate this caveat to it? So all of those details, um, and even at Fordrop, we never really got round to formalizing what those details would look like third party caveats sort of left as a kind of uh, some a work in progress i think i don't know whether they've they've done more work on those things um things like that um so yeah there's there's a lot of kind of gray areas here where at the moment they work better in kind of closed ecosystems where you can control all of the parties and you can nail down these uh details yourself um, I'd like to think if macaroons catch on that there'd be more standardization effort around this and they, they'd mature and these kind of things would get would get sorted out um, so let's hope for the future but at the moment yeah you need to be able to do these things What implementations of macaroons in the wild are you aware of? Yeah so there's, there's a few I'm aware of there's um not that many at the moment. Again, this is flex the kind of well, maturity level that they're at at the moment. So, you know, Google came up with them and I'm not aware of Google actually using themsel themselves anywhere. Um, so uh, Fordrock, obviously we added them and I know some customers were looking at them. By the time I left, I don't think any customers had gone live with, with the Macaroon um, implementation, but certainly some were, were interested. Uh, there's a few things I'm aware of. So the Lightning Network, which does kind of lightweight transactions on top of Bitcoin, that uses macaroons. 
um, and it uses third party caveats for uh, like micropayments. So you can have like an invoice as a third party caveat attached to a, to a token. Uh, and then when you pay the invoice, you get the, the discharge macaroon that kind of cashes it out and then you can use that. So that's kind of a nice thing. Um, I know uh, Ubuntu um, Linux, they have their Ubuntu One service, which is like their cloud service. That's like their single sign-on service behind there it was all built with macaroons in the background. There's kind of, you won't find any mention of it in the documentation and things like that, but if you... Um, if you go and look on Stack Overflow for like developers saying, oh, I got this error message from this service, you can see like mention of macaroons all over the stack traces and things. So that's all built on macaroons as far as I understand, or at least was. Um, there's a, a version of macaroons, a newer version called Biscuit, which we haven't really talked about yet. Um, so um, some people got, you know, uh, disappointed with these restrictions of macaroons to only be the shared secret. And they came up with this thing called Biscuit, which is like a public key version of macaroons. So it uses public key signatures. Um, it's a bit more expensive to do things. You know, public key crypto is more expensive than, than things. And there's some different trade-offs. They've done some interesting things around there. They, they have like a they define a really interesting format for caveats based on um, this thing called data log, which is, uh, and if anyone's ever kind of done prolog logic programming at university and things like that, so data log is like a simplified version of prolog. So you can, you can encode some really complicated and interesting um, authorization rules and biscuits. So, so, so there's biscuit then, and that's, so there's a, a company called Clever Cat Cloud who were involved in development of Biscuit and they use Biscuit then um, in a lot of their services as well for their kind of authorization of their class services. So yeah, so the, those are the main things I think I'm, I'm aware of, maybe others that I don't know about. Um, yeah, um, I, I think Biscuit kind of like open up, opens up a whole new path to go down towards, and that might be a very, very good topic for, for a future episode. Uh, the the last thing I want to ask is kind of like the, the flip side of that question. Um, when should uh, a developer or a team use macaroons? What what problems should scream mac uh, macaroons at them? And, and what production recommendations would you give them to, to be basically get a system working and, and not have issues. Mm -hmm. So I, th I think for me, one of the things I think that, that works really well for macaroons is, um, is when you want to kind of harden the security of the system, but you, you don't want to deploy something more complicated. So by that, I mean, uh, there's a lot of work now on looking at things going beyond bearer tokens in Earth too. So you know, all of the stuff we've talked about so far, they're bearer tokens. If you, they're like cash, you know, if you have them, you can use it. And so if somebody steals it, they can use it as well. Um, and so there's a, there's a bunch of standards around this so tying access to things like TLS certificates or this, the standard Depop now, um, dynamic proof of possession and things like this, which are trying to harden up these tokens. Uh, and add more security by tying them to some kind of private key typically. So you can't just use the token. You also have to have this private key that you sign something or you set up a TLS session or something like that. Um, but the problem with these kind of um, solutions is that they're really hard to deploy after the fact because you have to kind of upgrade everything at once. Um, you know, your authorization server has to issue... Um, you know, these, these kind of bound access tokens, which are bound to the private keys. Your clients have to know how to request these access tokens, how to manage the private keys, how to then prove possession of the private key when they're doing stuff. And all your resource servers need to know how to verify those things. Um, if you were using um, the token introspection we were, we were talking about before, where your servers are calling back into the authorization server, then you can switch to something like macaroons and it's kind of transparent to most of your software. So your authorization server can start issuing access token macaroons and nothing else needs to change initially. Um, so your resource servers that are validating the tokens, they're still just only token inspection. It just looks like another 
opaque access token to them. Uh, the client can treat it like an opaque access token to begin with. But then you can harden things slowly so you can change your clients one at a time to start adding contextual caveats before, like we were saying, before they make requests. Um, and so you get some of the benefits then that these are kind of hardened tokens that if they're stolen, they're harder to use. Um, they're kind of reduced um, scope and things like that. So that's kind of one of the nice things, I think, for using them. Uh, and then some of the things around these kind of fine-grained authorization things about before with third like caveats, things like that. In terms of like production. Oh, sorry, sorry to interrupt. Like, how should a, a dev that maybe is not an expert in, in identity and security think about this? Because on the one hand, macaroons offer these capabilities in, in an implementation manner that's probably simpler. But if you look at standards, if, if you look at like the OpenID working group and so on, you, you get guidance for like the deep up stuff. So there's also some, some things to balance there maybe. Yeah, definitely. Um, I think, I think that is, there's a trade-off. I think at the moment for the, where macaroons are on their kind of level of maturity, I, I would say, I would recommend, uh, that they be used only in kind of closed ecosystem internal deployments at the moment. Uh, hopefully over time we'd see them mature more and some of these standardization gaps kind of uh, filled in uh, and then they might be more suitable for um, uh, you know deployments external and facing deployments where you have more different um, actors involved and different parties involved um, so at the, mo at the moment yeah I, I would definitely recommend with the level of maturity the technology is at that, um, that you 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 try and deploy them if you're looking at deploying them in, in an environment where you control all the kind of moving parts to make it a bit easier for yourself. I think there's also, like in terms of technical things, that there are some recommendations. So the fact that it's all based on this shared secret key means that these keys have to be really protected. And so, you know, you need to look at key storage and key rotation. That are really important things to um, to look at and making sure you're not using the same key for everything in your entire estate, but you're kind of segregating keys and, you know, I use this one key for signing macaroons for these APIs, I use another one for these other ones. And there's also, there's a really great talk um, from a few years ago, one of the few kind of real um, in the trenches production deployments of macaroons. Um, it's by Tess uh, Renearson. Uh, hopefully, I pronounced her name correctly. Uh, a few years ago, and that that was on a, a, a kind of it's like a real it's a failure case really of, of deploying macaroons, but there's some really good lessons. Yeah, yeah, I, I saw that one, and, and we're going to add the video to the to the show notes here. So, uh, so, so one of the things they did there was um, they they kind of. They made a mistake with third-party caveats, basically, and this is, this is kind of really instructive, I think, in that they they had this kind of production auth service that was all you know designed to handle a lot of scale and handle all their traffic for all their systems, but then they added a third-party caveat that required clients to go to what was basically a toy kind of well, I don't know if it was a toy, but it was a, it was a small scale kind of Ruby on Rails app that just hadn't been sized appropriately to deal with the amount of traffic it was then going to do. And what you've basically done then is create like a production dependency of your auth service on this tiny little app that is not scaled appropriately for it. And so every time that app went down, you basically took out auth for, for everything, yeah. really. Yeah, I think it was uh, exactly what you said. They, they, had, they were um, validating macaroons on, I would, on that API, but they had a third-party sort of caveat and the... On, on the dashboard and the reliability capabilities of, of those components were fairly different, which is common for almost all products. And, and that kind of like was a big issue that they had. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So I, I think generally my, my advice would be to, I feel first party caveats were a lot easier to understand and a lot easier to kind of deploy and read about. Third party caveats are kind of like, you read about them, you go, wow, these are amazing. And you think of all these ideas, things I can use them for, but actually they're also a, a good way to kind of shoot yourself in the foot. So, you know, there maybe should be something that you, you 
get some experience with the technology first, then gradually think about introducing. Yeah, the typical uh, with the great power comes great responsibility. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's again, it's it's been amazing to to chat with you about these topics. Uh, you you know a lot, and and you can clearly explain them in detail for in in, in layman terms. So I, I really appreciate it. Um, I'm really happy we we got to chat about this, and maybe in the future we can do another episode with biscuits. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, yeah. There's also um, our be trailer, but the, I'm, I'm going to be presenting something hopefully at the OAuth security uh, workshop in in London, which is kind of my own take on some of these things. As well. so that yeah, definitely, and, and we can add that to the show notes once that becomes public, and, and we make the show the this episode available. Okay, it's it's been great having you, Nin. I really appreciate uh, you taking the time for this, and hopefully every listener here had uh, a good time learning about macaroons and, and how you can use them for authorization. Thanks a lot. Brilliant. It's been great being on. Thank you for having me. That's it for today's episode of Authorization in Software. Thanks for tuning in and listening to us. If you enjoy the show, be sure to subscribe to the podcast on your preferred platform so you never miss an episode. And if you have any feedback or suggestions for future episodes, feel free to reach out to us on social media. We love hearing from our listeners. Keep building secure software and we'll catch you on the next episode of Authorization in Software.